the patient uh, physics uh, technology have far beyond the from the past. So we all know uh, we have discovered the Boston particle stuff like that and. So what I want to know is, what is now the ultimate challenge in the physics that that now face? Oh, well, they, I think f the physics is a rather broad field, and I don't think there is a single ultimate challenge. I think, uh, of course, the, the big uh, challenge was to discover the Higgs boson. That was, that was uh, the, the challenge that, that, that the high energy particle physicists uh, had, had, have been faced with, and of course they, they did discover the Higgs boson. What that does for mankind, I think, is uh, really not clear, uh, because uh, it, it was very expensive building the accelerator allowed scientists to produce uh, the, the Higgs boson, uh, and it's not something, it, it doesn't last a very long time, it has a short lifetime. So, so it, it's, I think, it, what it, it confirms that 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 the particle theorists uh, really understand at, at a fairly deep level uh, th that kind of uh, physics, uh, and I think uh, it wasn't clear at all to a lot of people uh, that 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 they would ever see a Higgs boson, and as soon as they saw a Higgs boson, I think everyone decided that it would probably have been more interesting if they hadn't seen the Higgs boson. So, so I, you know, that's, that's just one piece of, of physics. I, I, you know, I think if you look in my field of condensed matter physics, what's really big right now is, is nanotechnology. And I, we, we call it technology, I suppose, because it gets more funding research if you call it technology than if you just call it physics now. <laughs> Uh, but, but in fact, uh, you know, there's a, a lot of very interesting uh, physics uh, which, which one can do with, with very tiny particles, uh, th things that you can either make. Obviously, the smallest particles we have are, are, are individual atoms, but I suppose if, if you tear an atom apart, uh, you have electrons and protons and and all sorts of things in the nucleus of the atoms, but, but those are, are generally not very stable. Uh, but, but certainly you can talk about, about making something uh, on the nano scale, and, and in fact that's been going on now, I would say for at least 20 years. There's some good friends of mine at Bell Laboratories, in fact were involved in that. There's a guy named Dave Bishop. Now sadly, Bell Laboratories, which I think was the greatest uh, research laboratory in the world uh, doesn't exist anymore. Uh, so in fact, no one's doing those sorts of things at Bell Laboratories anymore. But, but uh, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of, of nanoscale physics that, that is going on. And, and, and uh, I think it, the idea is, is that one can ask a question and then in fact you are driven to create a technology which will help you answer that question. And frequently in the process of coming up with new technologies to answer some curiosity-driven question that, that, that you might have come up with. In fact, uh, you, uh, not by accident, but, but as, a, as a product of, 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 of your research, end up uh, uh, developing a new device or a new technology which has uh, many other uses for mankind. And in fact, when I give my talk uh, later on uh, this morning, I, I, I will point out some of those cases where, where new technologies have resulted from curiosity-driven research. Why do you like to study physics? Why not biology or linguistics or any other field? Do you have any special? Wow. Th that's, that's an interesting question. I, I suppose that that when I was very young, it, um, in fact, I think I was six years old, uh, for Christmas, I got an electric train for Christmas. And uh, that, that usually, my father was a medical doctor, so he spent a lot of nights at, at, at the hospital. And, and so he would take a nap every afternoon. And, and but while he was taking uh, the, the nap, I tore apart the locomotive 
because I was very interested in, in trying to understand how electric motors worked. And, and so then he, he woke up and, uh, and, he, and he saw that I'd torn apart this, this toy that he'd given me for Christmas. And, and, and rather than scolding me and sen sending me to bed without my supper or something like that, he was, he was rather fascinated with my fascination for things electrical and magnetic. And so he would bring things home uh, f that his patients had given him. And frequently I was able to make these into, uh, shall we say, nearly lethal toys. <laughs> I I uh, uh, had I'd got a, a he brought home some parts from the telephone company. He had a uh, uh, patient who worked for the telephone company, and so it, it had a solenoid actuated relay. And I took the two leads from the solenoid and connected them to a 22 volt battery. And when I removed the leads, I got a good healthy shock. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I think uh, probably most of you in this audience, I hope, would understand. What happens, of course, when you interrupt the, the, the uh, electrical current flowing through the solenoid, uh, the magnetic field very rapidly decreases to zero. And as it does that, it induces a voltage across the coil. And of course, you have a lot of turns of, of, of wire. You end up getting a pretty good shock. So I took this thing to. Uh, to school the next day, uh, and, and the, the, the solenoid and the battery were in, in a duffel bag. And then students, and all that came out was a, was a lamp cord, the sort that you'd plug into the wall. And so I, students would, would, would squeeze the two prongs together, and when they released them, they would get shocked. And so, so I'm very lucky that I, I actually didn't get kicked out of school for that. But. Well, we've gone pretty far. What was your question, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> so I think that answered my questions. Okay. <laughs> Already. <laughs> okay. But try, try not to do that at home, right? Uh, well, I don't know. I, mean, I think within limits, okay, you, you can do these things. Uh, okay. But, the, uh, I, you know, I, th this curiosity driven i mean i was doing curiosity driven research at that point and i dare say i think that a lot of research is curiosity driven research and in fact i'll show some examples of where our curiosity driven research has resulted in in devices that that are very beneficial to mankind yes i i interest in your your answer and and i think oh what the difference of Physics and engineer. Yes, it's it's just a, it's just the same. I I don't know what the difference. Just okay. yeah, I, I agree with you entirely. That that uh, well, uh, of course, there's a lot of different kinds of engineering. There's chemical engineering. There's biomechanical engineering. They're all sorts of different. But in fact, I think that the 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 main difference between physics uh, and and engineering is simply. In fact, would, one could, could, a lot of it, you could say, is applied physics. Then that's really engineering. And a lot of, lot of my friends at Bell Laboratories were doing exactly that sort of thing. They were, they were developing new technologies to allow them to probe nature in some new and different way. Some of those cases, in fact, that forced them to develop new technologies and some of those technologies are, are being used by the telephone company even to this day. When you was young, uh, have you ever think before uh, someday you will get a Nobel Prize and what is make you be successful? Thank you. Good question. That's a really good question. And the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but I think that I should add a PS on to the no, and that is I think those people that actually pursue a career uh, with the expectation uh, of winning a Nobel Prize, most of those people end up uh, dying as, as very disappointed old men because most of the people that have that attitude are old men, I think. Uh, so, so, you know, I think that, that the people that, that are most successful uh, in, in, in science are, are those people that, that have a passion for understanding things and, and, and have a deep curiosity about, 
about how nature behaves. And, and, and so then they come up with new ways. And I'll talk about some of that uh, when I talk about nuclear magnetic resonance, which is one of my favorite uh, ways of probing matter. So, but but uh, th the answer is, I think there are people that, that, that go in with the idea of, of, of winning a Nobel Prize. And, but I certainly don't regard that as being the proper motivation. I think what you really want to do is understand something about nature that no one has ever understood before. And I think that's very positive uh, and, and it, it can certainly be very motivating. But I think those people that are looking for Nobel Prizes, probably most of them will, will never see a Nobel Prize. Knowing at some point that you might win a Nobel Prize is actually very unnerving because most of us have very full and, and exciting lives and, and, and the idea that you're going to win a Nobel Prize, it really, I can tell you, it really does change your life. Uh, and, and in ways, some ways that are good, like I get to do a lot of travel and come and, and meet a lot of different people all over the world, uh, but, but at the same time, I'm doing that uh, at the expense of not being able to do the research that actually got me the prize in the first place. Uh, from that question, from the former question, uh, so how is your life after you get the Nobel Prize? Uh, uh, maybe you are like a celebrity. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, okay, I think you know some of, of, of the answer to that. Uh, I mean, once you get the Nobel Prize, everyone wants you on their advisory board. Whether you, you have any advice to give, if it's some area that, that is completely d so far from removed from my area of expertise, but they still want me on their advisory board uh, so they can use my name. They don't necessarily use my advice. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I think the thing that I, I enjoy doing the most is, is this kind of thing where, where I, I sort of do in a lot of international travel and I, I make a lot of friends. I hope I can do that here and 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 the and, you know and part of it is of course this business about stimulating young people to think about careers in science because I think it is is important uh, so I, I don't know if I've answered your question but uh, that, that you so wh what happens is you you ask me a question and that stimulates me to to reply but but not necessarily to your question <laughs> do you know that a lot of history scientists, they like have to um, change everyone's belief and something like that. Is it hard for you to think in different way, something like that? Well, I think, yeah, I mean, as, as a scientist, I think, you know, you, you're, you're really in pursuit of, of, of an understanding of nature. And, and I think uh, at some point you, you're doing an experiment and you think you know the answer. Uh, but then you do something, you find, well, that's completely wrong. And so then you have to start thinking differently than you were before. And I think that's, you know, it's, it's kind of this fun game that's, that scientists uh, play, that they try to trick nature into giving up her secrets. And, and that's exactly the way my chemistry teacher described it when I was, when I was in high school chemistry class. Do you class. not feel tired? Like, it's fail every time. Do you feel something like well, that? I, well, Why you do if, you, if you fail every time, I suppose you should think about something <laughs> else to do. <laughs> but I think, you know, it, it isn't that you always fail. You, you don't always fail. You kind of, what you, you do learn from your mistakes. I think we all do. And, and so, so you, you, for instance, do an experiment that doesn't work, and then you say, okay, what did I do wrong? And then, and then you try to do it again, and, and it's, it's this, it's this uh, I still think of it as a conversation that I have with nature. Nature is a woman, of course, we all, you know, we all know that mother nature, right? And, and so, uh, if you ask a woman certain questions, such as, uh, will you marry me? Uh, you, you, you really don't understand the answer. So then you have to ask other questions, and that's the way, and, and each time you do an experiment, 
you're asking a question of nature. So we're not, I'm not going to marry Mother Nature. I'm already married. <laughs> okay. <laughs>